Good day, viewers. Welcome back to The Preaching Humanist with David Oliverio. That is I. Where the good life is guided by reason, informed by science, and motivated by human compassion, empathy, and love. Keeping church and state separate is very important. We hear about this topic from the experts often. A balanced humanist philosophy is what I like to talk about, is what I like to promote and present. Promoting the good for all is secular humanism and decreasing suffering. But not only is it about promoting the freedom and equality and goodness for all people, but it's also resistance against the approachment of fundamentalism, fascism, authoritarianism, and Christian theocracy. I am promoting a well-balanced philosophy called secular humanism. We must also stand against the approachment of theocracy in our government, in our lives, for everybody. Now, you don't have to be an expert and have a degree in political science or constitutional law to understand the basic principles of church-state separation. Now, I am not an expert on this topic, but I will hit on the basic points today that all of us should know. If we don't, that's okay. It's a refresher course, and it's a gentle reminder to have this information handy. Now, I get from evangelical Christians often through many years of talking to people out of my bubble all the time, I've had people approach me and say, David, you tell me how skin grows on the human body. You explain to me how we came from nothing. I'm not a scientist. I don't have all the answers, nor am I an expert in the field, nor will I take my time and dive into a field that I do not have all the answers in. But what I do do is refer people to experts. And in this topic of church-state separation, if people want to go deep, you refer them to experts, such as Andrew Seidel's book, The Founding Myth. Andrew Seidel works for the uh, Freedom from Religion Foundation. We all know about them. They're awesome. Also, Catherine Stewart's book, The Power Worshippers, Inside the Dangerous Rise of Religious Nationalism. Now, these are experts in the field. Now, let's go over a basic refresher course, if you will. Four quick points. Number one, Article 6 of the U.S. Constitution. There's a couple really good gems here in this Article 6 of the U.S. Constitution. Number one, the No Religious Test Clause shall ever be required as a qualification for any kind of government office. This is the only reference to religion in the entire Constitution. Now, you would think if this were really a Christian country and we were really founded upon the Bible, if we were really supposed to follow and make rules and laws based on biblical laws, you would think there would be a religious test. You fill out an application for a job. Someone wants to run for political office, local, state, national. You go in and fill out your application. Do you believe in God? It's not on there. The Boy Scouts, Cub Scouts of America, got to believe in a higher power. Alcoholics Anonymous, you got to believe in a higher power. Not in the U.S. Constitution, the No Religious Test Clause. It doesn't matter. It shouldn't matter. That's in our Constitution. Another gem in Article 6 of the Constitution is simply, what is the supreme law of the land in this country? Many think it's the Bible. 
It ain't the Bible, folks. The Constitution is the supreme law of the land. Very clear in the Constitution. Number two, here's one, the Bill of Rights. Most of you know it's the first 10 amendments or changes to the Constitution, the First Amendment. I know the experts I've mentioned go into great depth of this. The Establishment Clause, right? We understand that. Government shall make no respect for any religion or prohibit the free exercise thereof, right? What does that simply mean? It prevents religious control over government. And this is important. It prevents government control over religion. Now, if believers on the far right would only understand this concept, that it gives you freedom from the government coming into your church and telling you what you can preach and what you can't preach. You have the freedom to keep your beliefs where they belong, but not in the government. Government is prohibited from establishing or sponsoring a religion. The government is supposed to be neutral on religion. Otherwise, if a Christian can talk about their beliefs in government, then you must allow the other religions, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, secular humanism. But it doesn't happen that way. It's supposed to be separate. Now, let's go on to number three. Here's something that we don't hear often about. The letter to the Danbury Baptist in 1802 by Thomas Jefferson. This is where the phrase, a wall of separation comes. Now, there's not a literal wall. It's more of an analogy. It's an interpretation of the Establishment Clause from the First Amendment. Now, believers get all upset. Well, I don't see it written in the Constitution, the wall of separation of church and state. But the idea is prevalent, pervasive throughout the entire Constitution because there is zero mention of a God in the Constitution. The only mention again is the no religious test clause in the Constitution. It's a secular document. In fact, the first one in the history of the world. That's pure secular. This letter to the man Danbury Baptist talked about this wall. Now there are two James Madison quotes that are brilliant. Religion and government will both exist, both exist in greater purity the less they are mixed together. The founding fathers understood this concept. Here's one, another one from James Madison. The purpose, now you don't hear the religious right quoting this, the purpose of separation of church and state is to keep from these shores in the new world, America, the ceaseless strife, yes, strife, that has soaked the soil of Europe across the pond in blood for centuries. The founding fathers, whether they believed in God or not, that is irrelevant. But they knew, hey, ceaseless strife, bloodless, blood wars, soil stained with blood from Christians fighting Christians, Muslims fighting Christians, all centered around their personal beliefs in a God. Founding fathers, not over here. Keep it separate. It benefits everybody. And one more. We really don't hear much about this one. The Treaty of Tripoli. It was a treaty of peace and friendship between the U.S. and Tripoli, which is modern-day Libya in North Africa. In 1796, it's a long time ago, ratified, approved, by the U.S. Senate without 
Important to understand. Without debate. All the ayes. Aye. All in favor. Say aye. All opposed. All opposed. No one opposed. Without debate. Approved. Ratified. And signed by President John Adams. Now, here it is. What does it say in this treaty of Tripoli? The U.S. government is not, let me repeat that. The U.S. government is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion. Wow. Laced throughout the Constitution, all the founding fathers, whether they believed in God or not, they knew. This is what divides and keeps personal beliefs out of freedoms and rights for everybody. That's what the Constitution is. Liberty, justice, freedom and equality for all. Now, how do we resist this individually? First thing you can do is vote. Vote for people that believe in the Constitution as the supreme law of the land. And support some of the major groups that we have in our country. Freedom from Religion Foundation, American Humanist, American Atheist, uh, Secular Coalition for America, and there's about four or five others I didn't write down. I apologize, but they're all out there. Find one. Join these groups. Support them. They have attorneys like Andrew Seidel and others who fight for people's freedoms and keep that wall of separation in church and state up where it belongs. That's what we must do. We must resist this as secular humanists. So thank you for watching The Preaching Humanist with David Oliverio. Remember to let the light and the compassion of secular humanism shine. Have a wonderful day.